So it's food plot season, and there may not be a right way to plan a food plot, but there's definitely some wrong ways. On this segment from the Am I Hunting podcast, I cover some of my techniques that I use for my food plot program that you can take in consideration to help improve your food plot program as well. <laughs> So let's get into the topic at hand here. So, yeah, really, I mean, we are down to the wire when it comes to the preparation for deer season. Um, You know, one of the big things that I've been really stressing about, especially uh, during that first week of August, was trying to get my food plots in. You know, we've we've had a pretty, you know, significant spotty uh, regards to, you know, when the the rain was going to come, as well as I had our family vacation planned. Um, for this past week as well. So I was looking at the rain forecast and trying to decide on if I'm going to try to plant before we leave um, for our vacation or try to catch it afterwards. You know, I really didn't like the idea of, you know, doing after because, you know, that put, you know, those plants, you know, a couple weeks further back um, or delayed um, on starting to germinate and start growing and starting to put on some biomass um, than I typically like to do. The frame forecast wasn't the best though, but then we did have a day that looked promising. So I had ultimately ended up deciding that I was going to plant on that day. Unfortunately, the rain that was intended the following night really never came. So we'll see what happens in that regard. Uh, hopefully, I still get a pretty good germination. I, you know, I kind of get a little worried because that's essentially what happened when I tried planting my my summer or my springtime. You know cover crop slash food plot you know ultimately i planted and we had a pretty decent chance of rain for the following day and it just never came and of course everyone knows we had quite the dry summer where a lot of the summer food plots really didn't take off like they should have so when it came to my even my springtime planning you know i i was kind of up in the air exactly how i wanted to handle this so essentially what had happened during the course of the summer or from that summer planning you know, I tried for the very first time using a roller crimper. Now I had some mixed success with that in regards to some of the plant species. It did really well. Uh, I've been able to crimp. So a lot of like the really stemmy stuff. So the rye, uh, crimson clover, um, even some of the old brassicas that were starting to stem out um, and trying to flower. Those were crimped down really well. Uh, the two areas that I really didn't have any good success was with the the two areas that, or the two different species that really didn't do all that well, whereas the white clover, that really didn't get uh, terminated. You know, it did get set back a little bit. It did look like it was starting to die, but those plants bounced right back up again and ended up coming up again and kind of taking over that area where they were really dominant beforehand as well. The other one, again, was the uh, hairy vetch that was in the in the mix um, from the fall uh, carbon load. You know, this... Is kind of like a like a bit of a stemmy kind of viney type plant. Uh, that one it didn't get you know basically destroyed at all or didn't start to die at all. You know it got laid down with all the rest of the plants, but shortly after it stood right back up, stayed green, flowered out, and it wasn't until probably the summer when it probably seeded out. Unfortunately, that it finally did you know die off because um, when I went back this uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, that plant was really pretty much dried up and dead. So basically what I had on my hands was one, a lack of uh, the the summertime, you know, crop coming in. You know, it just, I didn't get a good germination. It didn't grow in because of the dry weather. And so I had a lot of thatch from the rye and the crimson clover that uh, got killed off beforehand, as well as a bunch of other vegetation and even some weed growth that kind of made its way through um, without any sufficient ground cover. So I basically kind of chalked up that I had two different options. One was to uh, come through with a tiller and do a mechanical tillage and terminate the plants that way by just tilling them up, breaking them up, uprooting them. Or the other option was to use glyphosate and spray them out and do a chemical burn on them. 
you know, both of them had their pros and cons. You know, the mechanical use is, yeah, I didn't have to use any harsh chemicals. The problem is, is I break up that soil, expose a lot of, basically uproot a lot of that organic matter, um, the carbon, as well as destroy a lot of the microbes um, that were in that soil. Basically, that mechanical process um, destroys some of the larger microbes, and then also it basically over aerates the soil, essentially and uh, can make it towards a very harsh uh, environment for those microbes to survive um, with that mechanical process. And then when it came to the chemical, again, you're using chemicals, using glyphosate or Roundup, and you know, there's some um, precautions with that as well as you know, things I've learned in regards to the fact that it can um, you know, inhibit your plant's ability to um, uptake nutrients or kind of suppresses some of your nutrients in the soil. Um, so if, if you have some mineral deficiencies, um, it may be as a result of some of that glyphosate uh, now allowing those uh, minerals to be, you know, basically uptaken by the plants. The plus side of the of using glyphosate is I'm not disturbing the soil at all. Everything stays intact, so I'm not uprooting anything. I'm not disturbing the soil, keeping that soil covered in that regard. The other downfall with the glyphosate is that I did have that additional thatch. You know, that thatch is not going to get broken down any more than, um, than what the new plants can do in regards to, you know, coming up and then the microbes eating up that, you know, thatch and whatnot, breaking that down. I guess that was the other plus side with doing the potential of tillage is that I have a nice clean soil bed to work with, uh, but no buildup of thatch that's going to prevent any, um, you know, seed to soil contact or not going to, you know, be too thick of a mulch to where the seeds can't, you know, push their way through before they run out of energy. So ultimately, uh, for this time through, I went with the uh, spray method. So per my usual process, I spread the seed out into the standing vegetation. Once that's done, went through, sprayed it, and then cultipacked it behind me um, after spraying to lay everything down to try to push it down and push those seeds in the ground with that thatch laying on top of them. So and ultimately from here on out, I'm not going to go back to the property or not look at the food plot uh, area, you know, at least for another two weeks or so. You know, I've, I've made the mistake before where I go down there too early and those plants are really starting to really starting to just come in and re feeling really disappointed. The fact that, you know, it's not looking as good as I thought. So a lot of times with that, I just give it time. And then, you know, an absolute worst case scenario that if for whatever reason these seeds didn't germinate or I didn't get a good stand or I didn't seed uh, evenly, if I have, you know, bare spots and whatnot, then I'll go through usually around that first week of September um, or actually about first of September to about mid September and supplement with some just, you know, rye grain and fill in those bare spots. Um, or make up for any you know, areas that didn't come in as well as they should have. Thanks for watching this segment from the MI Hunting Podcast. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and make sure you share the show with your friends. If you do want to see more, you can tune into the full episode right here on the podcast playlist. And if you're on the go, you can always listen to the podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms. And I hope to see you on the next one.